Let that help. Okay, is this working now? Is this is working now? Yeah. All right, okay, good. Let me start again. All right. Although the idea of occupying Wall Street was uh, floated first, so far as we know, by an activist Canadian media group, Adbusters, in mid July, it was on <laughs> September 17th that Robert Daros, 23, an unemployed carpenter from Florida, and others showed up on Wall Street to protest the economic crisis that had cost him his job. A protest on Wall Street. Hmm, what about that? It gathered steam. And a week later, on September 24th, in a classic example of what Gandhi called moral jujitsu, an assault by the New York City police catapulted the protest into, national and into a national and international issue. Since then, it's expanded to some 330 protests in solidarity. And that's our map. Can you see our map up there? Hello, technical people. I see the map back there. There it is. All right. This is according to the very reliable daily costs, um, uh, to 330 uh, protests in solidarity in every US state and Canadian province, from 30 in California to one in Mississippi, and 13 in Texas, to be noted. Uh, it has earned support, more or less, from leading Democrats and the condemnation of leading Republicans. Protests are always a combination of intentionality and opportunity. And civil disobedience has a long and honorable history in the United States, asserting voices otherwise not heard, polarizing issues otherwise muted, and challenging political leaders to take stands otherwise avoided. Has the Occupy Wall Street movement put economic justice on the nation's agenda again? Is it a Tea Party to the Democratic <coughs> left? Or is it a moment or a movement? These are some of the questions that our panelists, our discussants, will be exploring and that we'll be exploring in the discussion this evening. So let me introduce the folks that are going to be uh, talking with us. To my left is Vanessa Williamson. Vanessa grew up in Sacramento, California, the child of a historian father. Uh, she earned her BA in French literature at NYU. Uh, but after 9-11, uh, and her roommate wound up serving in Iraq uh, when she graduated, uh, she went to work uh, for the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America for six years. Uh, of course, a degree in French literature, excellent preparation for doing <laughs> that for all those who are pursuing degrees. Uh, frustrated with the workings in Washington where she headed uh, the Veterans Organization's office, she came to Harvard, uh, most particularly the Kennedy School, to pursue a PhD in government and social policy. Uh, she is uh, in the third year of her doctoral work and is co-author with Theda Scotchpole of the forthcoming book, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism. She also manages a website called I Heart Taxes, a pro-tax project <laughs> that donates its proceeds to the U.S. Treasury. Let's welcome Vanessa Williamson. Yeah. <laughs> to her left, to her left, uh, is Todd Gitlin. Uh, Todd grew up in East Bronx, New York. His parents were teachers. Uh, and when he graduated from high school, came here to Harvard, class of 1963, which is a year before I got here, 64. Uh, he graduated uh, from Harvard with a degree in mathematics. And you're going to see a theme here about <coughs> undergraduate degrees consistently <coughs> leading to certain career uh, paths. Uh, a degree in mathematics. At the same time, however, he'd become active in Toxin, which was a major uh, anti-war uh, organization at the time, anti-nuclear group, uh, became active in SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, uh, and just after graduation went to the convention where he was elected president in 1963. Uh, he helped to organize the first national organizations protesting the war in Vietnam, later continued his studies at the University of Michigan, earning a master's degree in political science, and then for nine years uh, writing uh, agitating, organizing, this is his words, not mine, uh, and uh, eventually returning uh, to school uh, at UC Berkeley where he uh, earned his PhD in sociology, uh, then <coughs> taught there for 16 years, uh, then to NYU, and now as a professor of journalism and, so and sociology at Columbia, uh, where he's also chair of the PhD program in communications. Uh, Todd is a poet, a columnist, the author of 14 books, including the Bulldozer and the Big Tent, Blind Republicans, Lame Democrats, and the Recovery of America. Let's welcome Todd Gitlin.
Did I get it right, more or less? All right. Uh, Governor Ed Rendell uh, grew up in New York City. Uh, his parents worked in the <coughs> garment industry, and he moved uh, to Pennsylvania to begin college at Penn. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania with a liberal arts degree, he continued his education at Villanova Law School, after which he served as assistant district attorney uh, in Philadelphia and was elected uh, district attorney in 1977. He was elected mayor of Philadelphia in 1991, served two terms, <clears throat> after which he became head of the Democratic National Committee in 1999, resigned to run for governor of Pennsylvania, to which he was elected in 2002, and re-elected in 2006, the second time with 60% of the vote. Uh, he now is a Brookings Fellow. Uh, he uh, teaches uh, at, uh, uh, at the university, uh, and he is a uh, columnist, commentator uh, on ABC and other, other outlets, but I think takes particular pride uh, in commenting and in introducing and following up Eagles games. Uh, and in fact has a column on the Philadelphia Eagles. So let's welcome Governor Ed Rendell. We'll ask uh, each person uh, to comment for about five minutes, uh, and then we'll open up the discussion. Vanessa. Thank you. Um, oh, can you hear me? More or less? Good. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about my experience. I have visited Occupy Boston a few times, and I also went down to Occupy Wall Street just last week. Um, and I, for those of you who haven't had the chance to visit, although you, you probably should, um, it's a really diverse group of people. Uh, you know, it includes students, as you'd expect, but I've met any number of military veterans and school teachers and other people. And uh, the thing that probably impressed me most of all, just in terms of the feel of the place on the ground, uh, is the level of organization that has begun to develop. And actually having visited the Occupy Boston several times, I've been able to see that really develop uh, to the point that, uh, you know, the libraries and, and sort of medical <coughs> services and, the, and the, the media setup is, you know, really very impressive. And I thought, I just, as I happened to find in my bag, I had forgotten, excuse me, to take it out. Um, they are even publishing a newspaper now at Occupied Wall Street, which I thought was kind of funny, the Occupied Wall Street Journal. Um, <laughs> so when I realized I still had my copy, I thought I'd show that to you guys. Um, and so obviously my background, I've been studying the Tea Party for the last two years, and a lot of people have, uh, have sort of jumped to draw connections between, between the Tea Party phenomenon and Occupy Wall Street. And I think that there are some ways that that's really wrong, in particular the, the ideology of the two groups is ex exceedingly different. Uh, I think sometimes people make the mistake of believing that most people in the Tea Party are upset about Wall Street and the bailouts. And from my own experience in sort of field work and interviews, that's almost never the case. There's sometimes a little bit of anger about the auto bailouts, and there's a lot of anger about the economic stimulus package and sort of more generally Obama's uh, progressive agenda. But um, the idea that money should be removed from politics is actually something that most people uh, that I spoke to oppose. So ideologically, I, I think that there's relatively little overlap. Um, but there are some ways that I think if we think about these two movements, there's something really interesting we can get at. And I think it might give us some, some handle, and I'd actually love to hear from everyone else about this, on what we can expect to see going forward. Is this a moment or is it a movement, as, as Marshall put it? Um, and there's sort of three things I think are, are interesting about the Tea Party that are really quite different from what we're seeing with Occupy Wall Street. First of all, um, the Tea Party happened very early in the Obama administration. People sometimes forget that the first Tea Party protests happened in February 2009. Uh, so Obama had been in office for about three weeks. And it happened at a time of real collapse in the Republican Party. The, the President Bush had left office with you know, historically low approval ratings. Uh, the McCain campaign had not only been unsuccessful, but at the end had sort of fallen apart structurally. And the RNC had just elected um, Michael Steele to be their new chairman and, and would spend the next few months in, in real financial trouble. Um, and so there was a, a real gap at the elite level in terms of organizing and a real, I think, uh, desire and maybe even desperation on the part of grassroots Republicans to find a new banner to rally behind. And that's really quite different from the position that Occupy Wall Street is in compared to the sort of democratic left. Um, the other two things that I think are worth thinking about, and I also just got a lot louder, um, are first of all, the role of elite media uh, in the creation of the Tea Party. Uh, from the very beginning, even those earliest protests in February 2009, uh, local conservative radio hosts often hosted Tea Parties and spoke at them. Uh, and you know, over the coming months, Fox News was, would play a really prominent role in promoting the Tea Party as an idea. Uh, and that's really quite different, I think, from what you've seen so far. There has been um, 
some sort of support for the Occupy Wall Street movement, tentative in some cases, but there hasn't been the sort of mobilizing effort, in part, I think, because left-wing media doesn't have the same sort of coherent mobilizing structure that you see on the right. Uh, the last thing I'd say, in terms of thinking about you know, uh, whether a movement can succeed, is to remember the difference between the goals of the Tea Party uh, and the goals of Occupy Wall Street in terms of scope. Um, and the long-term goals of the Tea Party might be you know, really quite large, but in the short term, they were looking to stop policy change. They wanted to prevent health care reform from passing. They wanted to prevent global warming legislation from passing. And at every turn, it's important to remember that stopping change is easier than creating it. So I think that it's important to think about, when you're, if you're thinking about comparing the Tea Party to Occupy Wall Street, how much of a bigger challenge Occupy Wall Street is facing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my goodness, where to begin? So for, I judge, four decades, the plutocracy has been growing in clout and wealth. And so one question to start with is, what took so long for this movement or moment to emerge? Uh, where has everybody been? And I don't, have, I don't offer a simple question, to, a simple answer to that question, but given the degree of hurt, the degree of avoidable hurt that is, in, uh, that is abroad in the land, it is kind of remarkable that it's uh, taken so long for this upwelling of feeling and initiative. I want to just pay some tribute to those who took the initiative, because I, you know, I think Marshall and I, who have a, an overlapping movement background, know that uh, I probably shouldn't say this here, but social scientists know almost nothing about how movements operate. And, and for that matter, people in movements don't know so much. <laughs> because there are no formulas. There are no, uh, uh, you can't stir the ingredients and make a movement emerge. There are contingencies, as we like to say. There are uh, unexpected eruptions. Uh, nobody, to my knowledge, uh, ever predicted the 60s, for example, uh, which then social science devoted decades to you know, sort of demonstrating were overdetermined in a thousand ways. So um, I want to say that this moment slash movement uh, should be seen as an amazing work in progress to have come to this point in one month so that we're actually having this discussion and that politicians now will have to take positions on it or explain why they don't. Or, and media are mediaizing, pontificating about it. And, uh, and there are people in all these cities doing these interesting things. It's really quite an extraordinary eruption. Um, I want to say something about how complicated it is. The, the occupiers were what I think of as the, as the, the inner movement. Uh, handfuls of people who actually took the initiative and started occupying territory. We are in a much different game now than we were even two weeks ago. Uh, one week ago at a day, October 5th, the demonstration that took place in New York started with a couple of hundred people in Zuccotti Park and by midday had accumulated many thousands. Um, I was there Police are loath to give estimates. Most people think there were between 10 and 15,000 people there. The very large majority, a super majority, were organized there by unions, by moveon.org, by professional associations, some student groups, and a sort of loosely attached middle class people. It's a very different crowd. Now, it is always the case in a social movement that there is an inner movement and an outer movement. Consider the outer movement to be those who actually can make a plausible claim to representing the 99%. The two major chants on the march were, first of all, we are the 99%. And secondly, uh, banks got bailed out, we got sold out. Anybody who says they don't really understand what this movement is about is clueless. Okay. Um, the dynamics of such movements, and I, I would say this was true in the Civil Rights Movement in its way, in the anti-Vietnam War movement, in the women's movement, all these movements that spring out of the 60s, 
are centrally determined in some long middle to long run by the dynamics that develop between the inner movement and the outer movement, the core and the periphery, the, if you will, fanatics and the affiliates by those who are more anarchically organized and those who are more hierarchically organized. And these dynamics are very fresh right now. I mean, here we are. This thing was put together in a few days. The AFL-CIO sent a, a, out an appeal of just a few days ago. Everybody in their list, whatever their mailing list was, should support Occupy Wall Street. The steelworkers sent out something saying, you know, do. I don't know, and I don't know anybody who does know how much of that is real, how much of that is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an impulse, <coughs> how much of that organization is letterhead paper organization, how much of it, how, how closely, how carefully the discussions are being held about what's to come. But I, I just want to underscore that um, it's kind of staggering to me that we're sitting here having this discussion. I just want to add one other thing about timing. I do think that had Barack Obama been defeated in 2008, this would have happened two years ago. Um, and this is not to complain about Obama. In fact, you know, a lot of complaining. One thing that's exciting about this moment, I have to admit, is that we're not sitting around complaining. I've been, you know, I, I've done a life's worth of complaining about America since the moment of the consolidated coup d'etat that put George Bush in the White House in 2000. Uh, enough already. Uh, it is, I think, remarkable that we have come to this point where we're actually having a discussion about strategies and about impacts in which politicians are on the spot, some of them who ought to be, some of them need to be and are not yet. Um, and it's hard for me to say anything definite uh, at all, of anything with any assurance, because um, there are so many moving parts now. Let me just close this by just itemizing them. There's the inner movement. Some people increasingly angry, frustrated, will become more militant. I'm quite confident of that. Number two, the outer movement. How will they play it? Number three, the Democratic Party politicians, some who have spoken, some who have not, including Obama himself. Number four, the, the opposition, the right. Um, and number five, not incidentally, the police, who are uh, the, the major actors in such dynamics. So um, that's, that'll just be my preliminary. Thank you. Governor Rendell. Well, good evening, everyone. And I was interested to hear both presentations. Um, I, I couldn't get, and I don't think you meant this, you think most Americans don't want money out of politics? You, I think you said that, but that's not accurate, right? I, I think I meant the Tea Party. Most people I spoke to in the Tea Party are not concerned <coughs> about the amount of money in politics. It's like a primary issue for them. In fact, I, many of them think that if you've made money, you have a right to use it in politics. Yeah, I, I think that's right. But I think the vast majority of American people do see that as one of the causes of where we are today. Look, I, I think the movement is great. I think. It needed to be said, and it needed to be said loud and clear. Politicians weren't saying it loudly enough, weren't saying it clearly enough. Consider the fact that 10 years ago, the average median income in the United States was $53,000. Last year, according to the census, the average median income was 49000 Now, that's only a 7% drop. But what makes it just a terrifying figure is it's the first time that's ever happened in the history of our country. The first time in the history of our country that in a 10-year period, median income went down. And every sign, if we keep going where we're going, that's going to happen. And we all know about the 1%, but do you know that the top 100th of a percent owns 6% of the wealth of this country? The top 50, the, excuse me, the top 10% wage earners, people who earn over $125,000, used to control 10 years ago 40% of the wealth in this country. They now control 50% of the wealth in this country. The trend lines are abysmal. Something has to change, and this is as good a time to change it as any. But what I think the movement has to do, and I was fascinated by Todd's description of the inner and the outer. 
you know, the movements succeed when they get the average citizen who's not part of that movement to say, you know what, they're right. And that's the first hurdle that Occupy has to get over. We need, and, and I think basically the American people understand, or they're starting to understand, that this growing economic inequity is not only hurting them, but it's gonna tear the country apart. And I think it's important. One of the messages I would give to the Occupy Wall Street and their progeny is keep this as peaceful and non-obstructive as possible. Because I don't want to lose the support of Susie Housewife or Joe Sixpack. They're angry. Joe Six Sixpack's out of work. He's a construction worker. He works two months a year now. And Susie had to take a job bagging groceries for eight seventy-five an hour. They're angry. They know things are screwed up in the country. But let's not do, give any reason to, for them to channel that anger any way other than a positive direction. That's number one. And I agree with Todd. The interaction between the police and the demonstrators is going to be very important in that developing dynamic. Secondly, is it Laura? Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, I'm sorry. What Vanessa said is, and she's correct, it's much easier to be against change than for change. And I think it's important that somewhere along the line, fairly soon, the movement articulate what change they'd like to see. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the change I would agree with, but it has to be something that can really galvanize people and that if it took place, would make a huge difference. And again, I'm not suggesting this is the only change, and I'm gonna talk about political change in a second, but I think a lot of the movement ought to be directed towards changing our political system and the way we fund elections. It is absolutely disgraceful. And it is why, if you want to know why special interests dominate, and they don't just dominate in Washington, <clears throat> they dominate in Harrisburg, they dominate in Albany, they dominate in Springfield, they dominate in Sacramento. It's because of the unbelievable amount of money that can be contributed. And in surreptitious ways, with Citizens United, an incredibly destructive decision. In the old days, at least, you could tell, my successor for governor ran and received over a million dollars from the Marcellus Shale drilling companies. But that was reported on his campaign reports before the election. So if you were a voter and you care about envi the environment, care about the quality of our water, worried about loosening or, or easing regulations on the shale drilling, you'd say to yourself, well, I can't vote for him because he's obviously taken all this money, therefore he's not gonna be very vigilant in protecting us. Uh, so now, but under Citizens United, there's no limitation. Literally, people can give $10 million if they want to, to these super PACs, and the worst part is non-disclosure. No one knows who's giving what, and what their motivation is at all, at all. It's entirely destructive. It's the reason that special interests control. And campaign, literally, the, the only way we can get campaign finance reform is to change the Constitution. It will take a constitutional amendment. Changing the Constitution is awfully hard, as anyone who uh, participated in, uh, in um, you know, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA, the ERA knows. It, 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 even though we had the commitment and passion of so many people, it, it failed because it's hard to do but it will give us something to, to, to strive for. And while we're striving for it, the volume of the movement might cause state, cause state legislators and even the federal government to make legislative change. But to get rid of Citizens United, remember, Citizens United was grounded on the First Amendment. We've got to qualify the First Amendment. In my judgment, all amendments are qualified, and Citizens United was a horrendous decision. But we've got to change that by either changing the Supreme Court or by constitutional amendment. So that's number one. And again, it doesn't have to be that. But we have to have a cause that the average American can say, well, that's what they're trying to achieve, and, uh, and that's a good idea. Then the movement will grow, and the movement has a chance to succeed. Second thing is somebody, and again, inner or outer, somebody's got to channel this towards political organizing. You know, the Iranian government issued a statement that these demonstrations were the beginning of the American spring, which would lead to the violent overthrow of the United States government. 
And I was asked about that on radio, and I said, those poor souls don't have a clue. We overthrow our governments at the ballot box. We did it in 2006, we did it in 2008, and we did it in 2010. But we've got a channel. I would love to know, and if somebody would give me an educated guess, what percentage of the people in Occupy Boston are registered? Or conversely, what percentage are unregistered? I don't know, I would hazard a guess, say 30% are. The reason that poor people can't overcome the influence of money, and when I say poor people, I'm including the out-of-work middle class, is because a lot of us don't register and a ton of us don't vote. Take the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia has 900,000 registered voters out of a population of 1.5 million. There are 300,000 children below voting age in the city of Philadelphia. That means there are 300,000 unregistered Philadelphians. In the presidential election, 61% of Philadelphians voted. That means of the 900,000, roughly 300,000 didn't vote, who were registered. And 300 other thousand weren't registered. So as many people didn't vote as did vote. Can you imagine what would happen to Pennsylvania elections and Pennsylvania congressional and senatorial elections if everybody registered and we voted at 75, 80%. And if there's ever been a reason to register and to vote, this is it. And we've got 13 months to go, 13 months to go. If Scott Brown doesn't want to change the, the tax structure for millionaires in this country, then we should register people and we should get rid of Scott Brown, and I say that as someone who has admired some of the stands he's taken. We should get rid of him, because that's an essential first step. It's more symbolic than anything else, but it's an essential first <coughs> step in beginning to focus on the income disparity. So let's figure out what the goal is. Let's try to have as common a goal as we can among all the Occupy movements, and then let's organize, organize, organize. And I don't think, as much as I, I have great friends in the AFL-CIO, I don't think they can be the only people organizing this movement. I think then it fails on its own weight. The right has a cogent argument to scare the living daylights out of a lot of those average Americans. Thank you. Uh, let's open this up here. Um, and actually, that's a, that's a good segue uh, there, because um, a lot of the energy behind the Occupy Wall Street is youthful energy. Um, and that's certainly, uh, there's no accident. Uh, and the sort of relationship between youth and social change is, is a pretty profound one. And in that sense, it's interesting because it's a bit different than Wisconsin, uh, where there were certainly young people involved in Wisconsin, but not across the country. And this has a, a, a different aspect to it that may give it a different kind of significance, I think. So I'm just curious, um, are there folks here who participated in the occupation, Boston or Wall Street? Let's see. Uh, why don't, you know, we usually go to the mics. For, let's hear from a, a few folks who've actually been participating uh, on your perspective. Now, there's a rule here in the forums that you're supposed to ask a question, and that a question is something that ends in a question mark. Uh, you can and, and, uh, Yes. Uh, and so uh, we're going to preserve that. But uh, uh, along the way to your question mark, uh, we'd like to hear uh, a bit of your perspective as a participant to sort of liven up uh, the discussion here. So is there somebody at one of the mics right there? Hi. Yeah. Um, I actually have a, a response to Mr. Oh, and, and you can say Sorry. who you are and what school you're My name is um, Melissa Barber. I'm a junior in Kirkland House studying social studies. And I've been at both Occupy Boston and Occupy Wall Street. I'm actually inspired by the methodology of uh, my professor, um, Professor Scotchpool, who co-authored the book with you. Um, I decided she interviewed people of the Tea Party to figure out why they came, how they heard about it, and then the demographic and political preference survey was given as an afterthought. And I thought that was a great methodology. So I'm not presenting this research as professional fast. high level, as, as great as hers, but I did go down to Wall Street and I did interview a lot of people, finding out, are you registered to vote? How liberal or conservative are you? Did you vote? Um, how did you first hear about it? And um, your issue saying that people aren't voting and that's the problem, people are dissatisfied with the results they're getting in the electoral process. More than 90% of people are registered to vote, and I think all but one person that wasn't registered to vote wasn't eligible to vote, they weren't US citizens. 
Furthermore, a supermajority, almost everyone, voted in the 2008 election. Most voted in the midterm elections. Um, people are frustrated by the fact that their votes weren't getting them the results they wanted. It's not an issue of people not voting. So, Melissa, your question is? Um, my question is, it was actually a response, because he said, does anyone know what? But what then? <laughs> well, this is like Jeopardy. It's like, no, it's like Jeopardy. You've got to sort of. I love it. <laughs> First of all. And who's the, is that directed toward? I guess. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. First of all, most, I'll accept, because you were there and I wasn't, so I'll accept that to be true. But I wasn't just talking about Occupy Boston or Occupy Wall Street. I was talking about the people who occupy Philadelphia every single day, hmm. the people who don't have jobs, the people who've been laid off. They don't vote. 61% voted, 300,000 weren't registered. That's half of us didn't vote in the presidential election. No less vote in a, in a governor's election or a senator's election. So I, I didn't mean to just focus on Occupy. And one thing that the, the Occupy energy can do is organize. And sure, you're unhappy that your vote didn't change anything. And I'm unhappy with the results of the 2010 election. I'm unhappy with the results of the 2008 election. I was for Hillary. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Oh. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, remember, you can't let the perfect stand in the way of the good. You've got to make choices. Elections are all about choices. And often those choices aren't things that make you enthusiastic. But we know people, we're going to know pretty soon who voted against the jobs bill, who voted against the millionaire's tax. And you're going to have candidates opposed to him who said, if I get in, I'll vote for the jobs bill. I'll vote to end the, uh, the economic uh, disparity, et cetera. You make a choice. You make a choice. That doesn't mean it's going to be Camelot all over again. And Camelot wasn't really Camelot either. But you've got to make your choice. And it's the only way to change. I mean, you can, you can live on Wall Street for the next three years. But if we don't make change <coughs> in the ballot box, it isn't going to happen. I think, uh, Todd, you have a comment? Uh, there was a youth movement in 2008. It was, in a way, the Obama campaign. It, was, it had also a utopian edge. There was a lot, I seem to recall, about hope. Uh, there was an interesting and, and, and inflammable mixture of hope and fervor that was in a mood to reject the last administration for reasons we don't have to dwell on. The crucial thing that happened in 2008 was that in a, in a statistical moment that I think is unprecedented, the youth turnout, turnout under 30, matched yeah. as a proportion of the population, turnout over 65. Now, you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, I'm over 65 and I belong with the under 30s, but most of the 65-year-old <laughs> voters are what you'd expect. They are actually disproportionately Tea Party members, according to Vanessa's research, and they are, tend to be Republicans. In 2010, the proportions reverted to normal. Normal means that the proportion who are over 65 outnumber the proportion who are under 30 by two and a half to one. If you want an explanation for the difference between the outcome of the 2008 election and the 2010 election, there it is. You don't have to look any further. Now, um, this means, I think, this is, poses a very powerful and a very powerful challenge to Obama because <coughs> there are a lot of disillusioned people. I was last mm -hmm. night with a group of sort of hard militant people from the New York encampment and Several of them had actually worked in the 2008 campaign. Now, people get impatient. They think because they elected a guy and he turned out he couldn't walk on water, that means that electoral politics is hopeless. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all been young. And, uh, and <laughs> I, you know, I'm foolish. Um, and, um, and but it's also foolish. true, it, it, there's another factor that I want to mention. Uh, the Republican Party has as a centerpiece of its strategy to, to gain and consolidate power, vote suppression. It was a big factor. Remember felons in Florida? That was a dimension of vote suppression. It was a factor in 2008. 
it will be an even greater factor than they're already mobilized to toss out votes. So it isn't just a matter of people registering and voting. It's also a matter of a political opposition to this fundamentally anti-democratic movement that is being arranged by what is fundamentally an anti-democratic party, namely the Republican Party. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to comment on that? All right. Uh, let's see if we can get a few more comments. Um, I think where, where am I up looking? here. Yeah. And, and this is with, with preference toward those who have actually been in the occupation. I want to give first shot. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, I, I, mean, I, is, I don't know though. if there's anybody like that. If not, yeah. we'll go right go ahead. ahead. Yeah, anybody? These, these folks. Okay, right here. Yeah. Uh, we'll hi. go right back up there in a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is John Phoenix. Uh, we had a conversation, me and Todd, on the radio yesterday. Um, I wanted to ask all of you a question, which was sort of a continuation of the discussion we had on the radio yesterday. Uh, we had uh, me from Boston, someone from LA, someone from New York, and uh, Todd. And uh, one of the things we were discussing was whether or not the Occupy nationwide movements, 140 cities, whether or not this movement should try or can try to organize some sort of third party for the 2012 elections. And the reasoning here being that a third party, if organized intelligently, might not be able to win in 2012, but could get at least 5% of the vote, maybe target non-swing states, so perhaps it does not affect the outcome too seriously, and would be in a much better shape going into 2016 to make even wider changes. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think of that potential strategy, especially since, you know, we seem to have given Obama full control of Congress the first two years of his presidency and he didn't seem to do much with it. Comments on third party, who would like to take that? Um, I'd, I'd be happy to just jump in a little bit and talk about, um, so uh, there was some discussion early on, uh, mostly I think in the, among sort of elite actors about whether the Tea Party should be a third party, since similar, in sort of a similar way, many in the Tea Party are sort of to the, see themselves as to the right of the mainstream of the Republican Party, we're very disappointed with, um, you know, things like the potential for immigration reform and these sorts of questions, or, you know, McCain taking a position that talked about global warming as an issue, these were things that they found very troubling. Um, and I, I think over time they, decided, you know, sort of everyone, basically everyone I spoke to, both at, you know, sort of like group leaders and then day-to-day -day activists, that that didn't make much sense because it was far more effective to try and drive the Republican Party to the right. And I think that they, I mean, I, the electoral results of 2010, I think are you know, quite convincing that you can move a party quite a significant amount to the right in only one election. Um, and I think that they also, and there was a really remarkable, it's very impressive level of organization on the ground locally by the Tea Party to take over local Republican committees. Um, and that's something that I think has been very effective. And it just, you know, there would be stories over and over again of people, um, you know, finding out when their local Republican committee met and about five people, either party, go to the, you know, the monthly meeting. And they would bring a hundred really mobilized conservative activists, you know, many of them, you know, long-time conservatives, but not, you know, with electoral experience, and they just swamp the meeting, and they'd take it over, and they'd replace the, you know, and they would sort of tell funny stories about how the sort of old guard of the Republican, local Republican Party, sort of the Chamber of Commerce types, would be like, well, maybe we should have a co-chair from the old, just to like show you the ropes and things like this, and how they would say no, you know, and so um, it was very impressive local organizing, and I think that I wouldn't, from my experience with that, I wouldn't give up on the potential of moving a party ideologically. Comment, Todd, Governor? I, I, I owe this um, piece of history to a historian named Lisa McGurr, who wrote an important book about the growth of the right wing in Southern California. <coughs> Suburban Warriors, it's called. In 1962, in Orange County, California, there had been already four, five, six years of very intense uh, ferocious organizing by the John Birch Society and affiliated hard right groups. And they had uh, started electing members to school boards and then they had elected members to city councils and so on. And by 1962, they had a substantial candidate for the uh, gubernatorial nomination. And he was defeated by a moderate Republican, Richard Nixon. So they were disconsolate. 
And they didn't know where to go from here because it looked like, well, the party system is blocked. You know, it's all a bunch of establishment people who run everything. So they went to, the, here's the difference between Republicans and Democrats. They went to their money bags guy, and there was basically one. If you've ever eaten Knott's Berry Farm uh, products, that's, that's the guy, Walter Knott. And they said, look, you know, it's a closed system, politics is dead, it's hopeless, we want to organize a third party and we'd like you to support us. And he said, you're nuts, because the political system is rigged. You can't do that in America because we don't have a parliamentary system. And he said, folks, roll up your sleeves, get back to work, take over the Republican Party, which they proceeded to do, not only in the state, but nationally. Now, the, you know, the moral of the tale, I think, it, it, crucially, the question is, is it feasible to actually operate in the way that you proposed, John, mm -hmm. that is, uh, to win 5% of the vote and then sort of do it on the up and up, uh, rather than the way Ralph Nader did by, you know, sort forays into Florida and other soft mm -hmm. underbelly places. Um, th no party but the Republican Party, 100 60 years ago has actually accomplished the, the, the role, the goal of, of dispensing with one of the old two parties and becoming a substitute. So uh, I think actually, if we're talking about difficult constitutional changes to make, I would bet the ranch on the prospects of campaign finance reform and public financing before I would bet the ranch on actually being able to overthrow the presidential system and replace it with a parlamentary yeah, system. Yeah, let me just, real quickly, total waste of time. If you did it in battleground states, you're just ensuring Obama's defeat. And if you don't like Obama, folks, just think, we're gonna have a Republican House in 2013. Because of the lineup, it's likely, although not definite, but we're gonna have a Republican Senate in 2013. And think if we have a Republican president, there is nothing to stop anything from happening. The change that they would reap, not that I was such great shapes, but since I've been gone, I had a Republican legislature, it's still Republican. They have done a brutal immigration bill, English as second language. They've retrenched some of the advances we made in gay rights. They are trying to change the electoral vote in Pennsylvania to make it by congressional district so that they can finally get some electoral votes. Uh, and even worst of all, they're, and they're doing this in other states, too, the voter ID bills, which mm -hmm. are going to disenfranchise a whole boatload of Democratic That's voters right. by 2012 if they pass. That's what's going to happen on the national, uh, uh, national scale. If you don't like Barack Obama, number one, he may turn out to be the last guardian at the gates of hell. And number two, oh. and number two. That puts it neutrally. Right. Yeah. And, then, and number two, <laughs> let me just say, Obama and a Democratic Congress didn't turn out so well. It maybe didn't fulfill all of your hopes or my hopes, but there are 31 million Americans who didn't have health care who are going to have it because of President Obama and the Democratic right. Congress. Don't ask, don't tell, it's gone. Don't ask, don't tell, it's gone. There are five million more children who have coverage under CHIP because of President Obama and the Democratic Congress. Lily Ledbetter was passed into law. Credit card reform, student loan reform. Applaud for student loan reform. Barack Obama gave it, and, and the Democratic Congress gave us all those things. He's not perfect. I'm disappointed to an extent, too. But don't forget what he's done. Good I'm, Lord. I'm getting the signal here. So. Good Lord. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get a few more voices in here. Um, and let's go up here. OK. And maybe we can get uh, two or three uh, and then uh, respond, just so we uh, get things moving a little bit. OK, so great. Ahead. Thank you. My name is Denise Velasco, and I am a MCMPA here at the Kennedy School, and actually from Orange County, California. Um, I, what caught most my attention with the Occupy Boss, uh, Occupy Boston movement um, was that I uh, saw a classmate who's actually a National Tea Party activist um, in the pictures from in our Facebook in our class Facebook and um, I just thought wow you know things are things are moving in an interesting in an interesting direction um, yesterday when I looked at the Boston Metro I was appalled to see that the Boston mayor said that civil disobedience will not be tolerated um, yet I was really glad to then open the paper 
and see a picture of an HKS MCMPA 2011 graduate handcuffed and wearing a purple SEIU shirt. Uh, it, it forced me to think of the Harvard janitors and negotiations with the university and, now. And, and the question? And, yeah, I'm getting there. And also, uh, and are also SEIU members. So here comes a question. Um, each of you took leadership in social movements in your youth and in your current youth. Uh, please share advice to us in gaining courage to, take make, to make sure that there is justice at the negotiations table with the janitors. So just advice on courage and, and making your voice heard when you see injustice. All right, let's get another over here. Go ahead. Hey, my name is Matt. I'm a student at the Divinity School. Um, so can you talk a little bit about... Um, Lean into the mic. Sorry. Can, you, can each of you talk a little bit about um, the challenges for, uh, in organizing for economic justice uh, compared to the challenges for organizing for racial justice. And what I mean by that is uh, there's some sense in which organizing for racial justice is not a zero-sum game. That is, uh, folks who organize on behalf of the oppressed and express solidarity with them, uh, they, everybody wins when, when racial justice is advanced. In economic terms, on the other hand, if you organize on behalf of the poor for, for redistribution and you're on the upper end of the scale, you might stand to lose something. So that obviously presents a different organizing challenge, a different strategic challenge. Okay. Could you talk about that a little bit? Okay, let's get uh, one more from down here. Yeah, hi, my name's Rich Minton. I live locally, and I happen to uh, get by uh, Occupy Boston just in time for the General Assembly on whether to stay in the extra-occupied part of the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And it's the only democratic discussion I can remember hearing in 20 years. The, ne the range of discussion... <laughs> The range, the range of discussion, and whether it's from Obama or in, in the Congress or, or any place else, is so narrow, uh, and it feels like uh, a populace has been given their viewpoints with the same marketing that they choose their toothpaste. And this was really remarkable because everybody got to speak, no matter what your opinion was. And at one point, when it looked like it was going to pass, they said, "Anybody want to block?" And that means. Do you want to stop this from going ahead? And they entertain what the person had to say. And, you know, question? why don't we have this? My question is, why in Boston, given our history, given this is the original Tea Party, given Sam Adams, and I don't mean the beer, <laughs> why doesn't Tom Menino want to see this grow the length of the Greenway? All right. So it's thank you. So we have uh, Courage, Economic Justice, and Tom Menino. So, uh, <laughs> who'd like to weigh into those? Well, courage, <laughs> you know, courage is... <laughs> people do remarkable things, and even uncourageous people discover that they're courageous when, and I don't know how to fill in the sentence, because it's mysterious. People suddenly become transformed for the good, or sometimes also for the not so good. But, and this actually bears on the, the question of civil disobedience, that the, you know, the actual, the, the idea of civil disobedience, which is a Massachusetts idea, Henry David Thoreau, uh, is at least as refined by Gandhi, is an idea about living a certain way of life. That is to say, one really does want, risk oneself and, and in the Gandhian spirit, which Martin Luther King actually largely adhered to, you are actually performing a redemptive act. You know, it, it is, in a way, a spiritual transformation. Talk about being born again. And when you, so, you know, there's no science of the, that I can imagine of, of the development of courage. But we are now in circumstances in which I think People, some people will discover they actually have courage they didn't know they had. And the genius of the idea of civil disobedience is that you actually engage with the adversary and you actually enter into a transformative situation. And that, if I may, go over to the question of economic justice because moral development is not a zero-sum game either. And um, um, it is the case that, as you say, I think that, that there is, I mean, there is a class war here. And as the left likes to say, the class war has been declared and was won by the 1%. Um, however, the slogan 
is not really an exaggeration. I mean, when the 1% when the control 40% of the wealth, 40% of the wealth, then, you know, there are probably some people in training across the street in the various houses who will move into the upper 1%, but most <laughs> of us won't. And um, so I'm not discouraged by it. I, it's something that occurred to me today, thinking about historical precedents. Um, how, many, uh, how many social movements in American history have actually begun with the premise of a majority at their backs? The abolitionist movement was not a popular movement. The women's suffrage movement was not a popular movement. Unionism was not a popular movement. The civil rights movement, mm, yeah, nominally, but there's some, take a look at the statistics about how Americans in general felt about nonviolent demonstrations in 1961, 62, freedom rides, sit-ins. Most Americans thought those kids should shut up that they're making too much noise. The anti-war movement, I, I know that at the beginning of the anti-Vietnam War movement, we represented about 12% of American opinion because the war was 80 plus percent popular. So this movement, this is very interesting, this situation. We really are the 99%. So therefore, I'm not discouraged by the fact that economic problems are different from race problems. I can't speak to Menino. I don't get it either. <laughs> Governor, would you care to comment? Well, I agree with almost everything Todd said. The only other thing I'd say is don't assume that just because someone would suffer a pecuniary loss from the redistribution of wealth that they're against it. I That's mean, true. I am making, this year I will make probably more money than I made in eight years as mayor and eight years <clears throat> as governor combined, and I would give some of it up to make things better in this country in a, in a blink of an eye. You ready to go buff it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa. Yeah, I think I'm actually, I'm- And there I, are more of us out there than you think. No, I, I think that, that's certainly true. Um, I mean, I'm going I'm to take issue with the idea that redistribution, that economics is a zero-sum game. Yeah, I don't I think that that, I mean, if you think about when we saw the largest economic growth in this country, it was a time when tax rates. 70%. Exactly. The five highest tiers of job growth in this country in the last 60 years occurred when the highest marginal tax rate was 70%. So I think that the, the, the you know, economic pie does grow, and it grows under circumstances like that. Um, and I actually, I, unfortunately, I have to leave a little bit early, and I do not think that I have anything to tell these people about leadership, so I will leave you in there. Well, we're going to, we're going to act, we're actually getting the sign right now, no. so if you have a closing comment you'd like to Go ahead, Matt. Well, I, I was going to say, I, it makes me really, really happy to see you all here. I'm especially happy to see so many people who have actually gone down to Occupy Boston and participating, uh, or, or just seeing what it's like firsthand, because I think that, that that's how you, that's how you really learn what a movement looks like, so. Well, I think our time, I, uh, this is uh, obviously a pretty engaging topic. And it seems like we're really at the beginning, not at the end, uh, as our panelists have suggested and as is evident here. Um, the time's up for our, our formal conversation here. But I think if any of our panelists would, I know Vanessa has to go, Todd might be able to stay, I don't know about Governor. We might be able to continue an informal conversation. I mean, we, I don't know, we want to, don't want to have an occupy the forum, I guess. <laughs> but it's always a possibility. So let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. I think it's 10 to a few hours. Marsha, Marsha, why can't we, the three of us, stay here? Why can't the three of us stay here? No, Vanessa has to go. No, no, I know Vanessa has to go.